start on, um, we've been on, uh, before we get into Revelation 20, verse 7, we're going we're gonna to end the chapter of Revelation 20. Next week we'll do something else on the church since it's our birthday. Five years in existence. 21st, well, the next week we are going to study about heaven and the new Jerusalem. And this only applies to believers. Now, if you're not a believer, you can be. And this would be for you. If you're not a believer, you will not be a part of this. Tonight is for unbelievers. We have two destinies. We have two final places. Revelation chapter 20 is the final place for the unbeliever. And in Revelation 21, 22 is the final place for the believer. If you look at your notes here this evening, and I like the way the notes have been done. The notes is very clear. It's the end of sin, uh, the end of Satan, evil, and death. It's the end of sin itself. The devil will meet his end in this chapter, but you don't have to wait to Revelation 20 for the devil to meet his end. His, his fate was already determined long, long ago. Mm -hmm. Sin's fate was already dealt with at the cross. Death has been defeated by the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So as believers, yep. we don't have to worry about any of this. This has been dealt with already. All we do is anticipating the call home and the return home for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for eternity. The reason why Revelation chapter 20 is probably the more, more important chapters of the whole Bible is because it does give a finality to Satan, sin, evil, and death. Death is the last enemy, according to the scriptures, to be conquered, according to 1 Corinthians 15. Death is the last enemy to be conquered before the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, even more so than Satan himself. Satan is a defeated enemy, and that needs to be understood. Even though he's allowed to inflict harm, even though he's allowed to rule this world, he's known as the God of this world. He is still a defeated enemy. And we must treat him as a defeated enemy. We not to give him any time of day, respect, or attention at all costs. He does not deserve our attention, our respect, or anything. We are not supposed to be scared of him. We are not supposed to be scared of Satan at all. There is no fear that Satan can put upon us that will keep us from God. There is nothing that can keep us from the love of God according to the book of Romans chapter 8. When you look at these scriptures here, it's very clear that after the thousand years, when Satan is finally loosed from his bottomless pit, in which he is bound for a thousand years, which is ten cycles, and these are the thousand years in which Christ will reign on this earth, and it's, it's, you think about this, and this is something that to really focus on. Christ will be on this earth reigning and ruling from Jerusalem. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> no more corruption, no more misery, no more pain, no more scandal. We will finally have perfect leadership. We will finally have peace on this planet. Yay. No more wars, rumors of wars, no more conflict, no more takeovers. You name it. Everything will be reigned and ruled by Christ himself. This planet will finally realize what true peace is. We will finally be rid of renegade rulers. Yeah. We'll be finally rid of idiots. We'll be finally rid of people that have an agenda. It is all going to be gone. People that put their blood, sweat, and tears into an agenda that will never come to fruition have wasted their time and lives. Because when Christ comes, Everything will be settled by Him. Nothing, nothing will get past the justice of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. No longer will we need a court system. No longer will we need a Supreme Court, or a Council of Churches, or a World Court. He will be the final <laughs> yeah. judge. He yeah. is the reign and ruler. Amen. The world fears this and does not want this. They do not, they do not want Jesus to reign and rule on this planet. They do not want Jesus to come back. Why? Because they're looking in the mirror at their own destiny of sin. They would rather want to live in the cesspool of sin. 
rather to be restored by God's presence through His Son, Jesus Christ. Sin makes fools of all of us. Sin has a way of disabling us and then destroying us. Sin will make us see mirages that are peaceful but are really not. Sin has a way of distorting facts from lies. Sin has a way of making good look evil and evil look good. Sin has a way of distorting what Jesus' agenda is truly is, is to reign and rule on here. Where we're going to look here after the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, Satan will be released. Now I can hear the moans and groans out there saying, if he is already in the bottomless pit, why let him loose? Why? Why do we need to face this? Well, here's the good news. The good news is that shortly after this, he will be put away forever in the lake of fire. This is part of God's will and plan. God's will is real simple. What are we to understand of God's will? Well, here's what we're supposed to understand of it. Ready? Here is the secret to God's will. This is what we're to do. We're supposed to follow it. Pure and simple. We, attributed to what sin has done to us, we tend to analyze things. Before we can believe something, we need, it needs to make sense to us to believe it. That was Thomas's problem. You remember Thomas? There will be a Thomas in every church. You have to go the extra mile just to get him to believe something that he should have already believed in the beginning. You remember what Jesus was very com compassionate with him, even though sometimes he probably wanted to wring his neck. <laughs> Thomas, believe. Thomas, accept. Thomas, just follow it. The key to being a full Christian is to follow God's will. We are never to ever debate, suggest, or to analyze God's will. We are never to question God's will. We are never to substitute anything for God's will. <clears throat> One of the things of free will that, meant that Satan has used from this time forward is that he has used man's will to substitute or to put in the place of God's will. I'm going to show you that on the part point this evening. Satan has fooled us to think that our will, some way, somehow, is equal, if not greater, than God's will. And Satan has deceived the nations into believing that it is their will to reign supreme and not let this man rule over them. But we find out very quickly that that's not the case. God's will will be done in heaven and on earth. God's will is the only will that matters. Now, here's the interesting thing about God's will that we need to understand. This is hard for us to swallow. Not for me. Because God has literally worked and got me straight up in the fact. Our life is not what we say it should be. God can change our life at any second, at any moment. God can, re God can move us and replant us. God can give us a different job. Tomorrow, our health can change. Our financial status can change. Something can change in which God will allow things to happen because it's His will. <clears throat> and why we focus on this is because Revelation chapter 20 is God's will. This is how things are going to be. God's will is to be followed. We need to get rid of the attitude of analysis. I hate that, don't you? I, you just follow it. Just follow God's will. Why did Why did God let say now a thousand years? Because that was His will. That's it. Well, why do we, Why does Why do we have to go through this? That's His will. It sounds simplistic, but that's true. That's the way it is. Today's Christianity, so-called Christianity, and today's preaching centers on analysis of God's will. And it makes the analysis of God's will to be very, very intrusive. 
have God said? Did God mean that? God, this is my favorite one, God has changed. God makes mistakes. So. Kenneth Copeland, you need to repent of your sins, sir. The greatest failure in the Bible is not God. We are not little gods. He actually said when Adam was created, he was a little god on this earth. No. We're nothing. We need, we need to grasp the concept that we as, as people are God's creation. We are, in this, we are created in His image. That does not make us a God. That does not make us equal to God. So you Mormons, you need to get over the fact real quickly that you're not gods and will never attain Godhood. It is blasphemous and it is wrong. It is not biblical and it is not realistic. You're holding people hostage through a fantasy and a lie that will send them to hell. Yep. This is the thing. Satan will finally get a taste of his own medicine in full. He will, he will suffer what unfortunately so many other countless souls will suffer is that he will face the music and he will face the penalty and the price of being rebellious against God in this world. Listen what it says here in Revelation chapter 20, verse 7. Verse 6 says this, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power. And this is another blessing that we believers have in Revelation 20, verse 6. Those that are resurrected in the first resurrection, you, we will never see death. Amen? Hallelujah. No death. Amen. Death will not conquer us. Death is has no power You're over defeated. us. That's right. What does that mean? You mean I will never you will never die. You will never perish. John 3, 16 and 17 say that. <laughs> Yay. Blessed and holy is he that have born the first death. Death has been done away with. We death will no longer be in our presence. It is gone. <clears throat> Praise God. Now on such the second death have no power. But they shall be priests of God and shall reign with them a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. First thing that Satan does, people do what they do because they are what they are. Right? Yes. What do you expect out of a thief when he's out of prison? Steal. Rob. Steal. Yeah. What do you think? What do you expect out of a liar when they get out of when they get out of their situation? Lie. What do you expect out of a killer when he's loosed out of prison? Kill. You cannot expect people to change apart from repentance. The only true change comes through repentance to the Lord Jesus Christ and the blood washing away their sins. That's the only way a person will change. So all you people out there that are in group therapy and, 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 and wasting your money on medication, that's not change. Okay? True change is only through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. And, and you cannot change your man. I'm going to change him. <laughs> you cannot change her. Not going to happen. Jesus only has the power to change people. That's right. Why? Second Corinthians five seventeen says, "Therefore, they are a new creature to those who are what in Christ Jesus." That's it. The only way. Obviously, here in verse eight, Satan, as we studied a few weeks ago, is what a deceiver. Yes. And what does he do? The first thing he does as he is loose out of prison is that he goes and deceives the nations at the four quarters of the earth. The very first thing that he does is to deceive the nations. People, Satan is in the business of deceiving because that's who he is. You cannot expect anything good out of evil. Nothing good will come out of evil. I'm tired of hearing that. That is wrong. That is blasphemous. Evil is evil. There is no such thing as, well, you know what, sin is good. It doesn't hurt to sin a little bit. Uh, you know what, a little sin never kill anybody. You know what, if you backslide or if, you know what, that's all right. No, it's not all right. It's, sin is never all right. 
sin has, Jesus never did say in the scriptures and in, as he taught that sin was acceptable. He never taught that sin has to be uh, is something that you that we have to deal with. No, Jesus came and did away with sin through the blood of the cross. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that our sins are what crucified with Him. Well, you mean to tell me if I want to sin, if I'm a believer, is there something wrong? If you have a great desire to sin, there is something wrong with you. You mean to tell me that your will is more powerful than his will? That's what you're saying. Are you saying that your wants and desires is greater than God? Are you saying that God does not have the power to keep you from sin? Are you saying that, that you are stronger than God? That's what you're saying. That's exactly what you're saying. And see, why are we saying this? Because Satan has deceived these people into thinking, you know what, we're stronger than God. We're better than God. We will win this war. We will combine everything that we have together and fight him and defeat him. And, and the devil will, con will deceive the people into believing that they can actually defeat God's will. That they can actually defeat God's purpose and plan. That they can actually defeat and get God off his throne. Can you hear the blasphemous talk coming from the devil to these people? How many people? Look at verse 8. Gog and Magog, we will gather them together to battle. As the sand of the sea. Now, right. yeah. you know what the great tragedy of, of all this is? Mm -hmm. The great tragedy is that every single soul on that day will go to God. Think about that for a minute. Some goals and dreams and wishes. It's, that's just part of being a human being. But the most important thing that we have is called a soul. And this soul that we have will never go away. The soul is the part of us that always exists. And whether you believe it or not, or accept it or not, that's not the point. I'm not trying to convince you of, some, of a, I'm not going to convince you of a, of a fact. Okay? That's a waste of time. God will bring that to fruition. God will reveal it to you. But what is something and what is enduring and what is very, very true is this. Is that of everything in your life that we have, everything in life that we have done, have said, everything in life, who we are, I will tell you right now, according to the Bible, according to Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, and even Psalms, if you read those three books in its entirety, the one common theme is, it really doesn't matter on this planet as far as worldly things what we do. And it really doesn't matter the accomplishments worldly wise that can impress God. The only thing that really matters on this planet is real simple. You know who Jesus Christ is. That's all that matters. God doesn't care how rich or poor you are. God doesn't care how popular or how infamous you are. God doesn't care if you have 10 kids or no kids. You may be saying, like, God doesn't care. Exactly. He doesn't care. All He cares about is do you know His Son? All he cares about is, is you, are you saved by the blood of Jesus through the repentance of your sin? On Judgment Day, one question will be asked. Who is Jesus Christ to you? That's it. He doesn't want to hear your resume. He doesn't want to hear what you've accomplished. He doesn't want to hear of anything that you've done, humanitarian or otherwise. All that matters is this. Do you know who Jesus Christ is? He doesn't care if you were a member of a, a mega church. He doesn't care if you gave the most money. All he cares about is this. Are you, do you know who my son is? 
Did you reject him or receive him? Did you obey him or disobey him? Did you follow his will or did you follow your own? Real, real simple. Cut and dry. This is not Bill Clinton. What do you mean by if is or whatever? Yes or no? Well, Pastor, everything, not everything's simple. Everything is simple. You're either pregnant or you're not. You're not a little pregnant. You either are or you're not. Amen? You either saved or you're not saved. Well, I'm partially saved. I have a, I got one more set to be saved. No, 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 no. You either saved or you're not. That's it. If if you think you are, you're not. If you have to go through a ten-step process, you're not saved. If you have to go in the word of, of a pope or a priest or whatever to be saved, you're not saved. Okay. We're gonna cut to the chase. You are not saved. Don't wait till judgment day to find out if you're saved or not, because you're not. It's too late. This is not a game show where God, where 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 Jesus plays Monty Hall and says, pick number door, number two, or number three. It doesn't work that way. This is real. God is serious about your life. God is serious about the life of this planet. God is serious about your future. God could care less about your past. He wants your future. The devil cares about your past. The devil is the one that cares about throwing stones. The devil cares about the mistakes you made in your life. The devil cares about the failures and brings them up to you. That's demonic. Jesus never ever went to his disciples and reminded them of their past. He says, what? Follow me. I don't care about your past. Now, if, if you bring the past to the future, then, that, then that's a problem. If you bring your luggage and baggage with you to the, to the future home, that's not going to happen. If you're going to bring air, all your past to Jesus every time you pray, you're wasting your time and His time. He doesn't care about your past. He's going to say it's done in the way with the future. Where are we going? See, the devil, here's his future. And we're going to find out in very vivid detail his future. See, this is what I care. I love you all. I don't want your money. I know that's going to shock you. Pinch yourself. Hey, brother, this preacher don't want our money. I don't want your money. Okay? God will provide for me. I'm not starving. Okay? I want your attention. Something that's priceless. Do you believe Jesus Christ is. I don't know. Then, you, then the answer is no. Because once you have a revelation of Jesus Christ, once you have a relationship with Him, you know who He is. Amen? You know exactly who He is. I had a friend of mine. This is sad. He came to me. He said, Pete, you know what? I don't know what to do. And I thought he was joking. He has, a, he has a habit of joking. He said, I don't know what to do anymore. I said, what's wrong? My girlfriend left me. My family wants something to do. And I said, why? What did you do? So what happened? Well, I did something that changed my life. I said, what'd you do? You became a Christian. He says, I'm alone. So you're not alone. You belong to the family of God. You're alone because all the people in your life that were in the same boat called the Titanic, that's what it is, the same boat called the Titanic. Think about it. Jesus was your life preserver. You left that ship. You're going to say, they're still on the Titanic. You moved on. They have not. They look at you different because you are different. Praise God. Are you scared? You shouldn't be. Kind of new? Yes. Your girlfriend left you because you're not the same person. Praise God for that. There's a better woman for you out there. Family-wise, you know what? Don't ever compromise your beliefs, your values, and your don't compromise the faith God has given you to be staying in. You know, this is what really takes me off. Your mom and dad cannot save your soul. Your mom and dad cannot do a darn thing for you. You're going to have to stand face to face with the Lord and Savior. No one's going to hold your hand. Parents, cut the cord. They got to learn the hard way. They got to learn the hard way. 
Because on that day, you're not, Jesus is going to say, uh uh, give it over here. This is between me and you. Okay? Right here. Cut the cord. That's what that would mean. He let me, that, he says, the only way you're going to swim is if I throw in the water, then you'll swim, which is true. You have to cut the cord. You have to cut the cord. You have to cut the cord. I told him, cut the cord with your family. Which is more important, your family or Jesus? Which is more important, their ways or his way? Which is more important, their path or, or the narrow path? I just laid it out for him. He says, I never heard anyone talk to me like you have, Pete. You just make it simple and plain. Because it is. I don't get I don't let emotion get involved. I don't let logic get involved. I don't get my opinions involved. It's just black or white, Bubba. That's it. You made a choice for Jesus. Your life has changed. Yes. But you're going to heaven. And when you go to heaven, I will see you there. But what about my family? You know what? Pray for them, witness to them. Don't give up on them. But don't you dare change for them. You have been changed. Okay? If they don't go, they don't go. Is that being cold hearted? That's being factual. It's truthful. It's truthful. And well, you will never make it as a mega church pastor. Well, great. I don't want to be one. Okay? But you, we got to be serious about this, folks. I, don't, I, don't, I think sometimes we, we're not. We make stupid decisions and choices and think they won't count against us. Every little thing will count against us. If we don't do it, the Lord's way. Let's look at what it says here. Here's the thing. This is You want to hear of the, of the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak? The last straw? The last straw comes from Revelation chapter 20, verse 9. The devil does something that just could, God cannot stand anymore. God is patient, right? Here's a shocking statement. God's patience runs out. Let me repeat that again. God's patience runs out. Now think about this. It runs out. Now if God's patience runs out, that's it. They went up. Here's, here's, here's the straw that broke the camel's back. They went up to the breadth of the earth. They surrounded the camp of the saints about in the beloved city, which is Jerusalem. They were going to take over Jerusalem, destroy the temple for the what countless time, like in the past, like in the Old Testament days. The devil thought that he could do it one more time. Satan really convinced and deceived the people that we're going to do this to Jerusalem one more time. We're going to deceive you. We're, I'm going to take you into battle. We're going to take over Jerusalem. We're going to destroy Jerusalem. It's going to be like the old days of sin. We're going to go back to the old days of sin and enjoy sin like we once did. That's what the devil says. We're going to enjoy sin. I'm going to deceive you to going back in time and reliving those glorious days of sin in your life when you were happy, when you were, when, when things had, when things went the way they should have. Amen. When, when you didn't know any better and felt good about it, when you were living in ignorance and you didn't care about it. Does that sound familiar? This is what the devil deceives and that's what he does. He convinces the world all the world's armies to go into Jerusalem one final time and destroy it and take it over and do whatever they wanted to and thinking that they could be like the good old days the good old days are gone this is a new era this is this is the Lord saying enough is enough there is a time in your life when we're gonna to have to say this as people and this is all not all of us here but those out there you're gonna to have to come to the conclusion that you can't go back one more time that you can't go back and enjoy sin like you once did. Because God himself will intervene. And he will intervene with fire. Look what it says here in verse 9. Fire came down from God. Let me read that again. This was not a cataclysmic uh, special event from space. This was not what Carl Sagan, all oh, these are billions and billions of falling stars at the same time coming down. No, no, no. Fire came from God. God personally got involved and says, fire. You are burned, Bubba. This is it. I will burn you up. You will be toast. Sodom and Gomorrah will look like a playpen according to what's going to happen here. You talk about an immense, immense hell on earth. This will be hell on earth. The earth is going to get a preview of hell like they've never seen before. When God says fire comes down from heaven, 
This is not a weenie roast, okay? This is fire, sulfur, brimstone, smoke. Have you ever hear, have you ever had the stench of skin uh, burning? Skin burning. Corey Tim Poom, who has passed on and gone home, once wrote in her book that one of the smells that she one of the smells that she never forgot in her whole life was the burning of dead bodies. She said that stuck. It was a smell that just stayed with you. And she said, and she never could get rid of it. She would put soap in her nose. She would put alcohol in her nose. Corey Tim Boom. She would put. I mean, she she put things in her nose. Just so she could get that smell of skin burning to get away. Some say that around the Holocaust in the ovens, the, the, the smell of skin burning or skin burnt was so pervasive that people wore masks just to be in that area. It just stunk. Now why are we bringing this up? Here's why we're bringing this up. Because we're going to return to that in the first time. This world is going to stink. This world is going to stink. Well, what kind of God is this, Pastor? I refuse to believe in a God that's this way. I refuse to believe in a God that you're telling me that this loving, peaceful God is love God is going to burn people. You're trying to tell me that this God, the same God, that I grew up with my parents and my grandparents and mamma and papa and all air the whole group saying that God will never hurt a fly. Or are you trying to tell me that God is going to do this? And that's what I'm telling you, Bubba. God's going to do this. God is going to do this. Well, you're misinterpreting the Bible. Read verse 9. Read verse 9. What does it say in verse 9? And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. I am not misinterpreting the scriptures. I'm not putting my own angle and slant on it. I'm not giving my personal opinion. The Bible says that God is going to have the biggest weenie roast of all on this planet because they went again to Jerusalem thinking that they could go, what? Again and again and take over Jerusalem. They, the devil would deceive and say, you know what? Let's go ravage the temple again and again. God says, that time is up. You are done. Sin misleads. Then when sin misleads, it leads to death. And finally, just for the sake of better words, instincts. Or well, we're making a big deal out of this. This is the end. Here's my question to you. I'm going to read verse 10. Verse 10 makes it very clear. The end of the devil. The end of the beast. And the end of the false prophet. The end. This is the final time that we will ever have to put up with Satan, sin, and death. But if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, you will join them. And you will be with them. And that same sucker that has deceived you, you will be with them forever. I have never been talked to that way, Pastor, and I don't like the tone of your of what you're saying. I'm trying to get it through your head and through your heart and your soul that this is reality. I don't care. I am not mismanners. I'm not going to come across nice. Your soul is at stake. This is real. 
Nothing is more important than your soul.